machinery and crackling of timber scream it louder than any statistic. The world has a ravenous appetite for wood. Each year, loggers topple four billion trees to satisfy our insatiable demand. We devour trees for lumber, paper, and byproducts from aspirin to film to toothpaste. In the last 50 years, global demand has doubled, and Americans lead the way, consuming 40% of the forest's resources. Trying to answer the challenge is a new generation of loggers. I've grown up in the woods, really. Just spent many, many days in the woods with my, my dad and my grandfather. My grandfather had to be physically tough to go out every day and deal with the dangers of falling large timber and, and getting the production he had to get. Today, the equipment makes our job out here relatively easy, but I would hope that my grandfather would be as proud of the job that I do today as I am of what he did in his era. The logging industry is characterized by people I would call geniuses with calloused hands because they had to use the muscle that they had in their bodies to be able to invent ways to move logs that may weigh thousands and even tens of thousands of pounds around in the forest. A single tree's journey from stump to sawmill seems to be a model of efficiency. It begins not in the forest, but at a computer. Specialized software helps foresters target groves to be harvested. Basically, the software it has a database in it in which people have actually gone out to the woods and collected information about the stands of trees, like the age of them, their species, or the trees per acre in the stand. And you can say, I'm interested in all stands of trees that are 60 years old. And it'll go through and bring up all of those stands for you so you can make the decisions about which stands you want to harvest based on what the computer's pulled up for you. A tree is quick work for the tool that revolutionized the industry in the 20th century the chainsaw. Side the Trees that once took several minutes to fell now topple in seconds. But its productivity pales in comparison with this mechanical titan, the single grip harvester. Operators maneuver a powerful articulated arm tipped with a rotating head. Vice-like grapples take hold of the tree. Then a chainsaw shears it off at the base. It then propels the tree through scraping blades that delimit. At the same time, it carves it into precisely sawn logs, a process called bucking. The actual grapples that grab the tree are also knives. And then on the head, there's two wheels that actually suck the tree through the head. It'd be similar as taking a stick of straw with the seed still on top of it and just pulling it through your fingers. It works on the same concept as that. The saw blade is so powerful that few operators could control it by hand. Conventional chainsaws have teeth on every other link in the chain. A harvester's blade has a tooth on every link. This enables it to saw more rapidly through even the hardest wood. With the mechanized harvesting operations, we can cut down trees 10 times faster than we can with a chainsaw. And we might cut 70 trees in a day with a chainsaw, and we might cut uh, 700 with a mechanized harvesting machine. The most I've ever done in one day is uh, 1,250 trees. And the record per hour is 172 trees. Felling and bucking timber is one thing. Moving is another. When the terrain permits, vehicles called forwarders shuttle logs to waiting transport trucks. In more rugged country, vehicles simply drag the logs. Loggers call it skidding. A variation, high lead skidding, elevates the front end of a log from a suspended cable. It begins and ends with crewmen called choker setters. Choker setting is the process of hooking uh, the steel cables that yard logs to the landing. And that choker is basically a steel noose 
that you put around the log, and as it tightens up, it squeezes the log, and that's how it is yarded or pulled to the landing. The process is as perilous as it is effective. People working as choker setters today are faced with a, a variety of hazards. Cables could break, logs could fall, limbs could come out of the trees that were broken via the movement of the log up the cable corridor. Just the movement on that steep terrain is difficult. The communication is crucial. The lines don't move until a person with a whistle gets into a position in the clear and provides the signal for the yarder operator to move the, uh, move the lines. The worst situation you could be in, you know, you're not expecting the lines to move, and they do, and you're in a position where you're going to be in the way. You're talking about, you know, logs that weigh tens of thousands of pounds. There are no odds on that. <laughs> it's uh, you lose. Today's men get no break. Things are moving so fast that they're constantly on the run. The machinery's faster, the rigging's faster. So today's logging inherently is more dangerous, except we're not allowing it to be. We're saying safety has to be first. One of logging's latest innovations is a radio-controlled choker. It relieves crewmen of the perilous task of releasing the nooses. Releasing them manually is dangerous because it is at that moment when logs are most likely to suddenly shift or fall. Inside this choker bell, there's a battery, electric motor, a receiver, and a circuit board. The way the choker setter sets it is you'll notice there's a button here. He pushes this button out like that, takes his choker, puts it around the log, into that slot, and closes that bell. Now it's locked into position. So the log will come into the landing, they'll let it down, the operator will push a button, and it will release this choker. No man has to get into that danger zone. Logging's cutting-edge technology takes its most literal form in the sawmill. Georgia Pacific's mill in Coos Bay, Oregon, built in 1994, is one of the most productive in the United States. It takes about 100 log trucks a day to keep up with the sawmill. An on annual basis for producing about 200 million feet of lumber. That's enough to build about 17,000 average single-family homes. Or if you want to look at it another way, um, enough lumber to make a two by four that would stretch around the world two times. A log's first encounter here is with the debarker. The bark must be scraped off because it is encased with dirt that can dull the saws that lie ahead. Debarked logs then race by conveyor before the vigilant eyes of the sawyer. He mans a computerized scanner that has only a fleeting instant to formulate the most efficient cutting strategy for each piece of timber. On an average day in our sawmill, we're going to run 4,000 logs through the, the head rig, or in this case, what we call the chip and saw. To have a person try and make a decision and get the most value out of that log 4,000 times a day without making a mistake just doesn't work. So you know, today's modern sawmill uses a lot of computers, a lot of scanners. As the log comes through here, I'm looking at it, and I'm looking at the scan that the computer has given. It can see everything, uh, knots, taper, and then it basically immediately, as soon as it clears the scanner, it's made a decision, and it pops up a picture, and it gives the length, the diameter, every board that's in there, and Usually, the scanner does a really good solution. Two kinds of blades transform logs into lumber. A bandsaw, a loop of steel strung tight between two pulleys, squares off logs into more manageable units called cants. Down the line, a gang of circular saws carves the cants in one pass into separate boards. The blades are brazed with carbide, a hard carbon compound that helps the teeth stay sharper longer. But the real key to a saw's efficiency is its thickness, or kerf. Thin blades produce the least sawdust. 20 years ago, 30 years ago, saw kerf 
which is the thickness of the saw, could have been as much as a quarter of an inch, or 250 thousandths, that's the same as a quarter of an inch. Today, I, I can't tell you specifics because it's kind of one of our, our secrets, that we're significantly less than half of that. If you were to use the old circle saws, you might get 10 pieces of lumber out of it. Now, with the technology and the improvements, you may get 13 or 14 pieces of lumber out of it. We've got that much more of that log going into lumber instead of sawdust. Cut lumber finally makes its way to a crew of graders who inspect each piece to determine its quality. They have a just a second, maybe a second and a half, to look at each piece and apply the grade to that piece according to the characteristics that they're viewing at the time. We have special crayon that the graders use that are readable by this system. As it passes underneath the camera lens, it takes a photograph of that, and it will sort the lumber out based on the mark that graders have put on the lumber. Lumber bound for market is used to make everything from furniture to crates to toys. But most of it ends up here. The construction industry consumes every other board produced in the United States. A nation with a voracious appetite for wood is using it to grow. Feeding that appetite is a challenge as old as America itself. The hardy men who started it all forged a legend as large as the timber they felled. Just as the rodeo pays homage to the romantic image of the cowboy, timber sports celebrate the larger-than-life persona of the lumberjack. Although 21st century loggers embrace the advantages of mechanization, they revel in their roots. Those roots date back to the beginning of the last ice age. In a moment of inspiration, an ancient innovator sought to improve the handheld sharpened stone he used as a cutting tool. He attached it to a long wooden handle, creating logging's most time-honored tool, the axe. In the centuries ahead, bronze replaced stone, eventually empowering the Egyptians to complete history's oldest known logging expedition. In 2700 BC, they harvested the lush cedar forests that covered much of Lebanon. Today, only a few scattered cedars remain there. Tools and techniques advanced little in the centuries that followed. In every culture, the essentials were the same. An axe, a strong back, and a river to transport the heavy timber. For the next two millennia, loggers feasted on the timberlands, especially in Europe. But until the 14th century, woodworkers sawed logs strictly by hand. Then water wheels began powering the first sawmills in Germany followed by windmill-powered systems in Holland. Forests fell ever faster as the population rose. Today, only 3% of Europe's ancient woodlands remain. In the New World, old techniques enabled lumberjacks to successfully assail the forests of New England and the Great Lakes. But when loggers ventured west in the 1850s, time-honored methods proved woefully inadequate. They were thunderstruck as they stepped in the shadows of the largest trees on the planet. Douglas fir, Sitka spruce, coast redwoods and giant sequoias dwarf the white pines abundant in the east. The attitude of the logger who came out here was one of awe. The average tree in the forest of Maine was about, the, a big tree was 100 feet high, maybe two or three feet thick. When they got out here, they found in the case of the giant sequoias, they were looking at a tree 230 feet high in some instances, 30 feet thick. So. When the loggers came west, they had no idea what they were getting into. Imagine somebody coming up to a tree 30 feet across and 230 feet high with a handsaw and an axe. Lumberjacks cast aside their six-foot saws and forged models up to 22 feet long. The men trying to harvest the treasure of timber were a motley throng of wayward settlers, ship deserters, and frustrated 49ers. But these misfits became bonded by a common purpose a lust for adventure and a freewheeling life in one of nature's grandest arenas. 
They were a pretty hardy bunch, you know. They were willing to fight at the drop of a hat, and of course they were in marvelous shape, lean and not too big. The average guy who worked in the woods was about five foot seven or eight, maybe 150 pounds. Once in a while you'd find a big guy, 6'4", 220, but on the whole they were a pretty lean, wiry group. One of the first obstacles loggers faced was the nearly impenetrable swollen bases of the mammoth trees. All the resins for, from years and years start to congregate in the last six, eight feet of the trunk of the tree, right above the stump. And so what they did is they, they had to get above that butt swell. The solution, called the springboard, became standard practice among lumberjacks well into the 20th century. Springboard is really nothing more than about a six or eight inch wide board. It had a little hook on the end and that would catch and you could hop up and you could put a 250 pound man on this springboard. Springboards gave lumberjacks just the boost they needed to begin the laborious process of bringing the mighty trees down. They would come in and decide where their horizontal undercut was gonna be. And then they would cut across the tree to a depth maybe about a third or so uh, of the tree diameter. They would then come in and chop out the undercut. After the uh, tree is faced up, we call it, they would come around behind the tree and then begin sawing at another horizontal cut, a little bit above the undercut, and then they'll have to leave a hinge between the front cut or the undercut and the back cut to guide the tree in the direction that they want it to go. The lumberjacks would even uh, uh, put out uh, stakes or markers out in the area where they were going to drop the tree and they'd take bets on whether or not they could drive a stake in the ground with a tree. As the trees fell, their titanic limbs often snapped off and lodged in the treetops towering above the forest floor. Days, even weeks later, they could plummet toward unsuspecting loggers. Well, if limbs broke out, especially a limb from, say, 100 feet up and came hustling down, that's what we called a widow maker. Because that fell, and if that hit him on the head, I mean, it would just drive them in the ground. You know, and if you were a married lumberjack, you know, you've just, uh, your widow is uh, going to a funeral now. Every tree that toppled set in motion the lumberjack's colorful supporting cast, assigned the Herculean task of transporting the huge logs. Their destination was a nearby river, the critical link to civilization around which every logging camp was based. First came the bullwhackers. For decades, their teams of oxen dragged timber by steel chains over a path of half-buried logs called the Skid Road. At the end of the Skid Road were the sure-footed river pigs. For the next century, they navigated America's waterways, driving logs as far as 70 miles to the sawmills. Each came equipped only with spiked boots and a pole fitted with a hook designed to maneuver the floating timber. Fighting a constant battle to break up log jams in the congested rivers, every river pig knew that one misstep could be fatal. Imagine trying to stand on a log or moving from one log to another on a river, and if you fell off of those logs into the water, and the water was filled with logs, you might not come up because you might not have a place to come up. Well, I could just imagine that feeling of, you know, trying to find daylight, trying to look up, and all you could see above you was a wall of logs and just going, this is not good. After hours, the river pigs and their colleagues brought their bravado indoors to the crowded bunkhouses. Up to 40 shared one room, reeking of sweat, tobacco, drying socks, and overflowing spittoons. A more popular venue was the camp's dining hall. The main event for loggers was food. The average logger burned 8,000 calories a day because his work was so hard he never got fat. The loggers' appetites, however, weren't restricted to food. Many sought release from their perilous profession in brothels and saloons that sprung up like weeds around their camp. After blowing four months' salary and one night of debauchery, they returned to the forests to forge their place in history. They had little inkling that in years to come, new machines and daring technologies would transform their world.
Beginning in the 1870s, timbermen in the remote western forests heard the shrill echo of progress. The first transcontinental trains linked their vast virgin woodlands with eastern markets, whose own forests had been depleted. Demand soared, but the industrial revolution that drove the railroad west also empowered the loggers. Mechanization radically changed how timber was moved. For decades to come, a huffing monstrosity called a donkey engine was the nucleus of every logging operation. Powered by steam, it turned a capstan that could pull cable-drawn logs more powerfully than any animal. The donkey uh, name came about because it was such a small machine, people said it really didn't have enough horsepower, so they couldn't call it a horse, so they named it the donkey instead. Donkey engines packed enough power, however, to inspire the high lead skidding the amount of energy required to pull those logs in. Productivity soared, but so did the accident rate. One of the biggest hazards was the bite of the line. That's B-I-G-H-T, not B-I-T-E, the bite of the line. And the donkey engine would start to pull that cable up, and it would pull tight. If you were caught in the bite of the line with a foot or an ankle, uh, that was the end of your legs. As the new system forced the bullwhackers out of a job, it created a spectacular new specialist, the high rigger. Equipped with spiked boots and leg spurs, he had the demanding task of ascending and prepping the spar tree. The high climbers would climb uh, probably 160 to 180 feet up in the air, although there were some spar trees that were taller than that. Uh, that's the kind of height that you needed. At a pre-calculated level, the high rigger faced the daunting task of cutting off the top of the tree. And after that tree fell, the, the weight of that tree would push that spar tree back, and he would just rock back and forth. It started to shrill off. He'd go up to the top of the tree and, and sit and have a cigarette. And if he really had nerves of steel, he'd do a headstand. With the spar tree topped off, the high rigger assisted crewmen in hoisting and securing the high lead pulley. As this new breed of daredevils elevated log transport to productive new heights, locomotive drivers below were literally spinning their wheels. For a decade, all efforts to haul logs by rail in the mountainous timber country failed miserably. Locomotives had little or no traction on the steep forest grades. In 1880, a Michigan lumberman named Ephraim Shea invented the solution. The Shea locomotive possessed one radical design change. Power from the lone cylinder was transmitted to the eight wheels, not by rods, but by gears. Every wheel was locked in a gear, so there was no way a wheel could slip. It's like a four-wheel drive. Plus, they were lighter, could navigate grades up to 10 or 12, 14 percent, which was unheard of and they could run equally well backward or forward. Shays enabled loggers to penetrate deeper and deeper into the western forests. Trainloads of timber rolled from regions once thought inaccessible. Logs also began moving along the most elaborate and unconventional transport system loggers ever devised, the flume. It was literally a man-made river. They built them in 16-foot boxes, as they called them, sections 16 feet long and hoisted them up on top of trestles in that fashion. As they start down the real steep areas, uh, the lumber might be going 50 miles an hour, splashing everywhere. Where there was very little uh, drop in elevation, you could walk along faster than the lumber was floating. A chronic problem was maintaining the flow of timber along routes that stretched for miles. A new crew of specialists, flume herders, manned remote outposts to guard against leaks and log jams. The flume hoarders lived there full time, and they had a bell hanging out over the flume. So as the lumber went by, it ticked the bell. So in the middle of the night, if a guy woke up and he didn't hear the bell ticking, he knew there was a problem. 
and he'd jump up trying to find the source of uh, where the jamma was. And if you can imagine, some of these trestles that the flumes were over, as they went over these draws and gullies, were 60 to 70 feet up in the air. These guys were walking on a little tiny catwalk. That was an extremely dangerous job, and there are many occasions where a flume herder fell off uh, the catwalk and to his death. Beyond the danger, however, was fun. For years to come, loggers seeking new thrills found them in makeshift flume boats. Anyone who's been drenched on an amusement park log ride can blame it on them. By flume, river, and rail, logs poured into the sawmills. The industry's survival depended on the Sawyer's ability to keep pace with the lumberjacks. Until the 1880s, their most crucial tool was the circular saw. It was invented in 1777, but now, coupled with steam, its full potential was being harnessed. Still, the enormous redwood and sequoia logs were often more than they could handle. In the 1870s, after years of persistence, engineers finally delivered a solution. They developed the first practical models of an invention patented in 1808, the bandsaw. For decades, craftsmen had been unable to accurately and securely join the ends of the band. Advances in welding techniques finally resulted in steel loops that could withstand the enormous pressure exerted by the flywheels above and below the carriage. The fast, thin blades could slice unerringly through even the most gargantuan logs. The advancing industry was supplying a rising nation all the lumber it needed to grow. But many looked to America's disappearing forests and worried that the price was too high. As the 20th century dawned, skyrocketing demand and eastern capital were transforming logging into a colossus of mechanized industry. A rough and ready trade was absorbed by corporate America and the timber barons. The greatest of them all was Frederick Weyerhaeuser, a German immigrant who began as a night watchman in an Illinois sawmill. In 1858, when the mill hit hard times, Weyerhaeuser scraped together enough money to buy it. In the decades that followed, he built up the most powerful logging company surrounding the Great Lakes. Then, he turned west. In 1900, Weyerhaeuser bought 900,000 acres of prime Washington timberland from the Northern Pacific Railroad. The price tag, $5.4 million. To that time, the largest private land transaction in American history. As the Weyerhaeusers of the Like a 20th century Noah, he would mass his logs to construct enormous ocean-going rafts. What he designed was a timber frame, and this thing was almost a thousand feet long. And as logs came in from the woods, he would take this big derrick and it would load these logs into this wooden frame. And he was very, very careful of overlapping the joints of the logs so he didn't have all the ends at one place. He'd overlap them to give them some strength. And when they were finally finished, they would take chains and wrap them around. And these chains are huge. These are those anchor chains that you see, absolutely massive. The chains alone weighed 250 tons. Released from their timber frames, Benson's rafts were as seaworthy as battleships. Many contained enough lumber to build 500 houses. Over the next 40 years, close to 120 navigated the 1,100-mile voyage to San Diego. Innovators like Benson pushed productivity to levels once thought unimaginable. Loggers cut a swath through the western timberlands, as if forests were an inexhaustible resource. At many sites, they literally stripped the landscape. Then at the turn of the 20th century, 
the shriek of the donkey engine was challenged by the voice of protest. Naturalists like John Muir deemed the frontier forests a living treasure that required protection. Muir's greatest champion was President Theodore Roosevelt. As both nature lover and die-hard capitalist, Roosevelt declared that America had to balance its demand for lumber with a keener sensitivity to the environment. In 1905, he created the United States Forest Service and appointed renowned conservationist Gifford Pinchot as its head. Pinchot believed America's national forests could be managed best by combining a reverence for nature with responsible exploitation. The timber barons on the one side felt that he was too excessive and, and too restrictive in terms of how forestry should be practiced. The John Muirs, on the other hand, felt that nobody should be using forest, period, that they should be set aside and left alone. Gifford Pinchot was a person who said, look, we can have our cake and we can eat it too. Pinchot's policy of multiple use set aside some forest land to be preserved while opening up other regions for lumbermen. A century after its inception, it still provokes controversy. Some believe it puts a stranglehold on the logging industry. Others think it leaves America's forests too vulnerable. Beginning in 1926, the debate intensified as the woods echoed with the roar of a new invention. The first practical chainsaws were the brainchild of mechanical engineer Andreas Still. His key design element was a chain of cutting teeth that rotated in a groove around a bar. The blades resembled the simple straight teeth of a crosscut saw. Until the 1940s, however, his prototypes weighed close to 150 pounds and required a two-man crew. The heavy gasoline engines had clutches that had to be engaged manually. Later models increased efficiency. Then, in 1946, a logger and inventor named Buford Cox conceived a radical new design for the saw teeth. He was sitting at the woodpile one day, and he was looking at this big wood-boring insect and they're about as big as your finger. And what they have is they have big mandible jaws in front, and they swipe at the timber and the wood and make this nice oval-shaped hole that they would bore through. And he looked at that and he thought, you know, if they can do that, I wonder if we could do that with the chainsaw. What Buford Cox did is he actually took that tooth and curled it over. And that corner of that tooth would grab the wood and pull it out. And then that really was the start of modern day chain for the chainsaws. The chain became better, the engines became lighter. Uh, we had a better technology in the weight. We uh, did a better job of, of the exhaust gases, for example, uh, moving them away from the operator. We had the upper hand, if you will, once the chainsaw came into the woods because we could, we could really cut the trees fast. Today's chainsaws are driven by a centrifugal clutch and can revolve at up to 13,000 revolutions per minute. As they've revolutionized the industry over the past 60 years, so has another bold idea from the 1940s. Before World War II, foresters began planting seedlings in the barren landscapes clear-cut by lumberjacks. The new generation of trees was specifically intended to be harvested decades later as timber. It marked the birth of the tree farm. Since then, 37,000 tree farms have sprouted across the United States, most of them in the South. Seedlings are first planted and cultivated in nurseries, then transplanted in harvesting tracts. They can uh, grow trees uh, much like you grow uh, corn. Uh, trees are planted in rows. You can manage them because you can put uh, equipment uh, on the flat terrain. So there are some advantages uh, to being able to uh, uh, farm the tree as a crop. Today, more than a third of the world's harvested timber comes from tree farms. Some experts predict that by the year 2040, they will cover an expanse the size of Utah. Their expansion may seem the most obvious solution to the nation's rising demand for wood, but obvious solutions are often not as simple as they first appear. 
A tree farm is not a forest. A forest is a web of life with many different species, a great variety of plants, and everything all interacting together to have literally a web of life. When you change the forest to a single crop of trees or even a few species of trees, the result is a tree plantation that is very sterile rather than there being the diversity that is essential for species to survive in the long term. Despite such concerns, many see few viable alternatives as we look to the future. We're going to grow from 300 million people to a billion people one day in the United States, and wood has to come from someplace. So I suspect that we may have to have areas of the United States where wood fiber is grown on very short rotations so that we can reduce our costs and yet provide a lot of wood for America's needs. The debate is just part of an enduring conflict between the logging industry and environmentalists. Their struggle is the result of a society at cross purposes, one that seeks to protect its resources as much as exploit them. In an effort to solve the dilemma, innovators are literally taking bold new steps. Today's logging industry faces obstacles Paul Bunyan might have found insurmountable. It must feed a wood-hungry world that has a passion to preserve its forests. It must meet the spiraling demands of a new century, yet avoid the practices that scarred the last. Three centuries of exploitation have cut deeply into the American landscape and into the federally owned forests that comprise 29% of the nation's timberlands. In the Sierra Nevada's National Forest, all the way through until the early 1990s, clear cutting was the main method of harvest. And so what we end up with is a site that is a bare, denuded hillside, and the values that are important for wildlife and other species are no longer there. It's just putting human needs first, the human needs of growing a crop of wood. In their zeal to satisfy the nation's demands, loggers destroyed much of nature's most monumental handiwork. Less than 4% of America's old growth timber remains. In the matter of uh, the sequoia trees in Converse Basin that was logged by the Sanger Lumber Company, which I call the most destructive logging in the history of the world, they cut down 8,000 giant sequoias, and those trees take two, three, four thousand 4,000 years to grow big. Destruction on a scale far greater is now occurring in South America, where 200,000 square miles of the Amazon rainforest have fallen. There, few government controls exist to prevent developers from stripping the landscape of its rich diversity of wildlife. In the U.S., loggers operate according to strict federal and state regulations, but they continue to cross swords with environmentalists as each asserts their own visions of what constitutes responsible forest management. Forest issues are not black and white, and obviously the vast majority of foresters and those trying to produce timber on forest lands do care about wildlife and water and other values, and the vast majority of environmentalists recognize that you have to produce wood products. So in many ways, the challenge is for the environmentalists and loggers to work more and more toward the common middle ground where there are a lot of overlapping opportunities. In my grandfather's era, after World War II, it was production, you know, get the pieces to the roadside, get them to the mill, and, you know, brute force and strength. And today it's more finesse and, and uh, you know, minimal disturbance to the environment. Today, we have to get production, but we have to do it smart. These days, there's a lot of new high-tech equipment that's being used in the timber industry, and our center is very supportive of the conversion to this high-tech equipment because it benefits the environment. The cut-to-length processors have a minimal 
uh, pressure per square inch, and so they don't compact the soil like traditional uh, equipment does. They don't create huge ruts. They're very, very light, even on moderately steep hillsides, very, very light on the land. The less compacted the soil, the better the chances for the trees left standing. Since the 1970s, loggers have demonstrated this most dramatically with the helicopter. Nothing protects the fragile forest floor more than rising above it. But airborne operations are rare, conducted mainly in remote areas inaccessible to ground machinery. Will those types of machines become more important in the present and into the future? Probably so, but we're going to have to reduce their cost. They're very expensive. I think they're about seven times more expensive than conventional systems. Scandinavian engineers are developing what may be a feasible alternative. Their six-legged prototypes, aptly called walking machines, can negotiate even the steepest terrain. Their impact on productivity could be as profound as their lack of impact on the forest floor. That technology is very intriguing. You're just putting that weight on one spot, you don't see the impact of like a road through the, through the trees that you do with using wheeled equipment that uh, creates a path. It was developed in the Nordic countries when they were trying to harvest areas that were peat bogs and they couldn't hold up the heavy equipment and it senses when it won't have enough uh, support for it and will put the actual foot of the machine in a different place once it knows it's not going to support it. Can technology help bridge the gap between the logging industry and environmentalists? Both camps are hopeful, but their enduring struggle seems destined to escalate at the same rate as our global appetite for wood. Policymakers will have to balance our needs as consumers with our concerns for the health of our forests. Right now, it's at a stalemate. And until we have some charismatic leaders come forward from the environmental community, and from the timber industry and the agencies that manage our public lands, we're not going to have a resolution of the conflict. Most environmentalists recognize that we all need to use wood, and they don't want to say, stop logging, even though there will be a few that have that extreme view. But the vast majority of environmental groups recognize that responsible forest management can provide wood products that we all need. We need to be able to go to the lumber yard and buy two by four. We need to be able to put up houses. But we don't need to clear cut the way we used to. We don't need to destroy the wilderness the way we used to. So we need some uh, moderation. We need government control. John Muir said that uh, Uncle Sam was the only one who could preserve the forest, and he was absolutely right. If the past is prologue, loggers will continue to meet our insatiable demand for wood with imagination and innovation in a complex world that strives to revere nature as well as exploit it their challenge will be to defy the popular saying and always see the forest for the trees the way to hear hear and hear goes through here the lumber yard where big things start loading cutting shaping and shipping in this vast noisy complex the mighty tools don't take breaks the lumberyard on modern marvels next on the history channel